I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. There was a case in the north of the country where, you know, a number of people were infected and they just couldn't figure out how that could be because people were, you know, they thought they were keeping, uh, you know, the lockdown in place. And it ended up being that the man had gone to see his his girlfriend who was, in fact, an asymptomatic carrier. And, you know, the tragedy of it, of course, is that one of the children of this man became very, very, very sick, you know, required intensive care. He's fine now. But, you know, they had to sort of confess. But we, you know, this is a country where, where you know, adultery is, is, I think, very much part of life. The saying is, you know, in two, there are always three. And then sometimes, in many cases, that's four. Um, and one of the, the things about the lifting of the restrictions last week was that you could go see your relatives. You could go see people with whom you had an established uh, relationship, which would be girlfriends, boyfriends, etc. But could you go see your lover or could you go see your mistress? And it became sort of a... A fine line, and I think the Italians decided that yes, indeed, they could go see them. What it's been officially sanctioned by the government that you can go see your significant other. You do not have to be in an established relationship. If it's someone you, they don't want you to be, you know, hooking up on Tinder. They, but they do say that if you are in a in a relationship with someone, uh, you can you can in fact include them among those close to you that you can go visit. All right, and and part of that is of course the draconian divorce laws you have in Italy. That's right. A lot of people who are in relationships uh, are not able to remarry or to even be, you know, enter into a civil union because it takes about 10 years for a divorce to go through in this country. But, but this particular issue did go beyond those who intended to ever marry or, or to officially be dating. But uh, the government has decided to turn a blind eye on those who have extramarital um, activities going. Traditional family is under attack like no other time in history. God instituted marriage between one man and one woman and is very holy to him. Why is marriage between a man and a woman so sacred to God? Genesis 2, 23 and 24 And Adam said, This is now a bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Ephesians 5, 31 through 33 for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. By mystery, Paul means the hidden plan of God that has come to fulfillment in Christ Jesus, as we read in Ephesians 3.9 and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. Thus, the Apostle Paul's quotation about marriage from Genesis 2 and Ephesians 5.31 ties into the relationship between Christ and his church. Paul's meaning is profound. He interprets the original creation of the husband and wife union as itself modeled on Christ's forthcoming union with the church as his body as we read in Ephesians 5.23. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, marriage from the beginning of creation in Genesis 1 was created by God to be a reflection of and patterned after Christ's relation to the church. Thus, Paul's commands regarding the roles of husbands and wives do not merely reflect the culture of his day, but also the present. God's ideal for all marriages at all times as exemplified by the relationship between the Bride of Christ, the Church, and Christ Himself, the Son of God. The biblical concept of marriage is a oneness between two individuals that pictures the oneness of Christ with His Church. The idea of open marriages perverts the relationship Christ has with His Bride, the Church. Satan is busy in these last days, destroying marriage in every way possible. He got a foothold when gay marriage was legalized, and now anything goes. Satan hates marriage, and in particular, he hates Christian marriages because believers display the gospel and glorify God in their marriage. Satan thus aims to destroy Christian marriages because such opposition hinders the witness of Christ 
to the world. 1 Peter 5.8 Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Welcome to the Watchman YouTube channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Jesus prophesied of future plagues associated with the last days, as we read in Luke 21:11. And there will be great earthquakes in various places, and famines and pestilences, and there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. All eyes on those new jobless numbers that are due out later this morning, and the chair of the Federal Reserve issuing that urgent warning of lasting economic damage. So our Rebecca Jarvis joins us with the latest on all that. Good morning, Rebecca. Good morning, Robin. That's right. Jobs are the additional casualty of this pandemic crisis across the country. And the Fed chair is now warning that if Washington does not act with additional stimulus, the impacts of this economic decline will be long lasting. Overnight, an urgent warning from Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell. The scope and speed of this downturn are without modern precedent, significantly worse than any recession since World War II. Just this morning, a new report showing an additional 2.98 million Americans filed new claims for unemployment benefits last week, bringing the total number of workers who've lost their job in just two months to more than 36 million. Overnight, Powell calling on the White House and Congress to do more. Additional fiscal support could be costly, but worth it if it helps avoid long-term damage and leaves us with a stronger recovery. The desperation growing for people like Monique Howard in Northern California, laid off from her job as an office manager. I'm a single income with a special needs son who can't work. I don't know how I'm gonna continue. Leading to surging demand at food banks around the country. ABC's Will Carr visiting one in Texas, preparing to deliver millions of meals to people in more than a dozen states. Volunteers like Nancy Dooling seeing a record number of those in need. We've ordered food in expectation of getting more people coming to our pantries. Amid the unprecedented economic crunch, House Democrats unveiling a new stimulus bill with the largest price tag ever. $3 trillion, including another round of direct payments to Americans totaling up to 6000 per household. And the House is set to vote on that bill on Friday. Republican leaders in the Senate have already vowed to block it. Experts believe some sort of new stimulus package will eventually get passed, but it won't be this one. Robin? But Rebecca, as you mentioned, the House set to vote on that $3 trillion in stimulus money, and many are asking, how would we pay for all this? Well, and eventually someone will have to pay for all of this stimulus, already trillions of dollars worth of it. Most economists believe that it's been necessary to spend at this point without thinking about the future. But at some point, that future does mean higher taxes for someone out there in order to pay for this stimulus. This is what a nation looks like when they tell God they no longer want or need him. Since America will not recognize God as the creator of all things, follow his commandments, and give him the glory that only he deserves. He has left this nation to its own destruction. Proverbs 16.6 says, In mercy and truth atonement is provided for iniquity, and by the fear of the Lord one departs from evil. There is no fear of God in America, and the result is a society full of evildoers. When we are choosing to hold on to sin, rather than repent and change, God will not hear our prayers, as we read in Isaiah 1.15. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you even though you make many prayers. 
I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Proverbs 28.9 says, One who turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer, is an abomination. America continues to do evil and disregard God's moral law, ignore his Ten Commandments, make up a God of our own liking, and continue to do what is right in our own eyes. America continues to lie, steal, blaspheme God's name, fornicate, commit adultery, look at pornography, covet what is not ours, and take human life. Jeremiah 30.12 says, For thus says the Lord, Your affliction is incurable, your wound is severe. As a nation, I think America may have reached the point in time where God will no longer hear our prayers because our sin is incurable. We're going to turn to your money tonight and the rising prices at grocery stores across this country, the challenged supply chain, and grocery store prices jumping now. The biggest one-month rise in nearly 50 years. And tonight we hear from the families now skipping meals. Here's Victor Akendo on this again tonight. Tonight, those new numbers showing record-breaking prices at grocery stores are forcing families to make tough choices. If something's gone up a dollar, I'll either find an alternative or honestly not purchase it. Kelly Johnson from Dundee, Florida, says her grocery bill has gone up $50 a week. But these shelves used to be full, overflowing. It's looking pretty bleak. And milk's going out. The single mother with five kids at home doing what she can until she can go back to her job as a restaurant manager. We sometimes have to skip meals. We're down to two meals a day. It feels like I'm failing as a mom to take it to that extreme. It's the biggest jump in food at home prices in nearly half a century. Eggs up more than 16%. Hamburger meat up nearly 5%. Chicken up nearly 6 Some pork products up more than 10%. Before the pandemic, Americans were spending more than half their food budget on eating out. People are staying home, they're not going out anymore, and so there's a, a big increase in regards to sales in grocery stores. Grocery stores are seeing on average over 25% sales increases. The other byproduct of increased demand that's hurting families are less deals. A lot of these grocery stores are not offering things on sale. You're really going to have to do your due diligence as a shopper because you're not going to see many promotions in these stores anymore. These prices might continue climbing. Experts predict they could go up 4% by the end of the year. Jeremiah 18, 7 through 10. The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to pluck up, to pull down, and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. And the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to build and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good with which I said I would benefit it. A new military offensive in the middle of a global pandemic. The southern province of Abiyan is the latest front line in Yemen's war. Government forces backed by Saudi Arabia are inching closer towards the provincial capital Zinzibar. They are fighting to end what they call an armed rebellion by the Southern Transitional Council, the separatist movement which is backed by the United Arab Emirates and determined to break away from northern Yemen. The breakaway fighters were once allies in the fight against the Houthis in the north, now enemies in the battle for control in the south. Last month, the southern separatist fighters declared self-rule in their stronghold the port city of Aden, and now want to extend control over nearby provinces. Victory is close. Only a few hours separate us from Abyan and Aden. We are well prepared. Our morale is high and men are ready. Not far from the shell fire, Yemenis and Aden are fighting against an invisible enemy. The new coronavirus. The city is reporting the highest number of infections and deaths in Yemen, as more cases are detected elsewhere. The lack of testing facilities means many infections are going undiagnosed and many deaths unreported. Five years of war between Houthi fighters and government forces backed by a Saudi UAE military coalition have forced millions of Yemenis from their homes. They are in cramped camps where running water is a luxury. We are afraid for our children. We have elderly people. 
and we are in a remote place and we are afraid the virus will spread like wildfire, especially if the disease appeared in Tyus and only the directorate of Motra is between us and the virus, meaning that it is very close and we are in fear. The World Health Organization says the virus could rip through Yemen, where only half the hospitals are functioning, and aid agencies have warned of famine. Yemenis are caught between the pandemic and civil war, with no end to their suffering in sight. From homes in Colombia, to parks in Paraguay, to streets in Argentina, sanitation workers battle to get the outbreak of dengue fever under control. More than 3 million cases were reported last year in Latin America, an all-time high. Scientists warn the numbers this year could be even higher. On dengue, there's a possibility of surpassing the historical record of 2009. That's when Bolivia experienced the worst epidemic of any disease in its history. We had 80,000 cases nationwide, of which 61,000 were registered in Santa Cruz. The Aedes aegypti mosquito carries the dengue virus, poor sanitation and climate change with both heavy rains and long periods of droughts are all making the outbreak worse. Doctors across the continent say hospitals are struggling to keep up with the number of new patients and that COVID-19 is further reducing the resources available to treat dengue fever and other diseases. COVID is the star right now, so all of the attention is on COVID. But there are still problems with dengue, malaria and Chagas. In provincial areas, there's a problem of hospital capacity. Dengue fever is not normally fatal and can be treated with painkillers. Some sufferers experience symptoms such as fatigue, weight loss and depression. Patients with severe cases are advised to go to hospital, but many people have been staying away because of the fear of catching COVID-19. The first thing I thought was, I want to stay home before I expose myself. I'm not going to hospital. My friends recommended I go, but no way. I prefer to treat my symptoms at home and only go to hospital if it's serious. With four strains of dengue in circulation, doctors say people may catch it more than once and that the second case is more likely to be severe. Candace Plain says she's making the most of the little food she has. She lost her job at a Johannesburg printing company when it was shut as the lockdown began weeks ago. With no income, she depends on government support to feed her four children. The mayor of Johannesburg says people in a million households don't have enough to eat. The national government in Pretoria has increased the child support grant and it's created a special grant of $20 a month to help workers who've lost their jobs survive the lockdown. Government leaders say they're spending the equivalent of almost $3 billion on the unemployed and the poor. But even before the lockdown, 45% of Johannesburg's 5.5 million people lived in poverty. To make the crisis even worse, many workers have lost their jobs since the lockdown began. The government says it's handing out food parcels to about 2,000 homes every day, but it's simply not enough. Organizations like this one are trying to help fill the gap by handing out two cooked meals every day. Nuran Gain has run this food charity for seven years but says she can barely keep up since the lockdown began. The organization relies on donations and she's not received any help from the government. Delia Jones has run this barber shop for 16 years. It's been closed for weeks, leaving four staff members with no work and Delia without any income. She's applied for a government grant but has not heard back. Instead, her customers help her buy food. With an economy largely stalled and no clear indication of when the lockdown will end, many are relying on handouts to survive. We are currently living in a time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. We are fast approaching a time known as the tribulation that Jesus says will be the worst time in human history, as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. We are currently witnessing events that will continue to become more frequent and more intense until God pours out his final judgments on an unbelieving and unrepentant world. One of the judgments described in the book of Revelation includes the price of food being so high and scarce that it will cost a full day's wages just to barely get enough to eat 
as we read in Revelation 6, 5, and 6. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. In this prophecy, it will cost a day's wages just for a loaf of bread. We are not in the tribulation period yet, but we are getting extremely close. Isaiah 43, 1, 5, and 6 But now, thus says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Ever since the destruction of the Jewish temple in 70 AD, the Jewish people have been scattered all over the earth. One of the many signs we are living in the last days is the Jewish people would return to the land of Israel. This prophecy was fulfilled in the late 1900s and is still being fulfilled today. Thousands of years ago, Hebrew prophets foretold that one day the Jewish people would return from all over the world. It's happening right now. They come from all over the world to a place many have never been. Yet the Jewish people have longed to return to this land for thousands of years. I'm Sarah from France. Hi, I'm Dylan from Uruguay. I did Aliyah in December. I'm here because I love Israel. Hi, my name is Debbie. I'm from Cordoba, Argentina. I'm Nikita from Russia. I study nuclear physics. Hi, my name is Gadi. I'm from Brooklyn, New York, and uh, I made Aliyah in December. Uh, I'm a lawyer in New York, and uh, I'm here because it's the only Jewish state there is. It's called Aliyah, literally going up. Taken from biblical times, the term describes when people went up to Jerusalem to worship at the temple. Now it means immigrating or returning to Israel. You're an American. Yep. <laughs> Why did you come? It's a beautiful country. I love it here. Yeah, Arizona's beautiful. Arizona is beautiful, but it's not Israel. Why did you come? It's hard to live like Jewish, religion Jewish in Ukraine. Right. So I think it's my country, my home. And why did you come? Rio de Janeiro is a dangerous city. Oh, it is? Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. And the economy there is not so good. So You said it's a dangerous city there, but Israel is surrounded by people who would like to destroy this land. You don't feel any fear here, anxiety about being here? No, not like in Brazil. Last year, 27,000 new immigrants arrived in Israel, including 3,600 from the United States. For almost 3,000 years, we were disconnected, but we were praying for Jerusalem. So it's real and gathering of exiles, and it continues every day. I spoke with Natan Sharansky, leader of the Jewish Agency, which oversees bringing the Jewish people home. I am very proud to be the head of the organization now, which brought three and a half million Jews from the creation of the State of Israel. What is it that in inspires people to do this? Uprooted from their culture, their country, everything they know, to come to an unknown land. I lived the life of absolute assimilated person without roots. Mm -hmm. And I know how shallow, uh, how decadent is life without identity. Mm -hmm. When you can't really connect yourself to anything, uh, when you don't have any heritage to give to your children, and then I also discovered the different life, life with the identity, life inside history. Sharansky made headlines in the 80s as a political prisoner in the former Soviet Union. International pressure led to his release and he immigrated to Israel in 1986. I meet with a lot of new immigrants and I love to be in the airport and to see this moment of them going down from the airplane because you think that after each of these people there are at least 50 generations of Jews who are praying and dreaming about coming to Jerusalem. And each of them is closing a huge circle of thousand years of exile. Biblical prophets Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel all spoke of a time when God would bring the Jewish people back to the land of Israel. The prophet Amos says they'll never be dispersed again. Hosea 3.5 Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days.
One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Time is short. Accept Jesus today.